found out about it on November 11th. <clears throat> so November 10th, we were in Georgia having a great time waiting for a baby to show up. And then this tragedy happened. My baby was born 36 days after the sinking. And for some reason, my son Jeremiah loves green and everything about green. And I'm thinking, isn't that odd? My dad loved lime pop and green. So I think we have to really spend a little time in heaven together. And then when Jeremiah was born, everything was green. And I, I just never could understand that. And then it kind of come to me, well, maybe they had a conversation, you know, <laughs> within God's presence. Uh, this is right after I came, came up to Michigan and we had done a, a birthday service for the 50th anniversary of the launching of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So we had shipbuilders, we had book authors. Unfortunately, I was the only family member that attended. We're just like any other family. We fight and argue. We have our opinions. And um, my opinion sticks with Roscoe. <laughs> Others go up to Whitefish Bay. Some go to Duluth. But I choose to come here actually closer and I have such a family here and I want to I know Tim is going to speak a little bit but I just want to tell you a little bit about Tim McCall I met him in the year 2000 I think he was 14 and in the eighth grade and he had a website it was called SSEFO it was Edmund Fitz, uh, Steamship Edmund Fitzgerald online so I clicked on and here I'm talking to a 14 year old young man who was smarter 20 times than I was he knew so much about the ship. I was just amazed at what he taught me as a 14-year-old and in the eighth grade that he started a website and then we connected with that, each other all the time. And then we had the opportunity to meet at Mariner's Church one time. And he's in the audience tonight. It just thrills my heart that somebody I've known all these years has come to a service for the second time. So I'm honored that he and his family are here. This is a picture of me ringing the bell in Whitefish Bay that when the services are held, they're having one tonight also, that bell comes out of the case and it sets to the side and then they have special bell, bell ringers that we can pick. And this year I picked Sean Lay who was um, part of the Shipwreck Museum. So tonight he's ringing the bell for Robert C. Rafferty, the steward, and I'm, I'm really proud about that. And Oh, there I am. <laughs> Sam, could you bring your sister, your daughter up real quick? Is your, your brother here? Yeah. Okay, maybe bring both of us up. This is my firstborn, Lori, and she was five when the ship sank, and she remembers him. This is my sister-in-law, Carla, which I love so dearly. And this is my brother Randall, and uh, we've become a very, very close family. And this tonight, I'm so proud because Randall came and Carla came and Lori to help me celebrate the life of my father. And instead of it being a sad uh, event, I want it to be with love and understanding and not so much emotion, but for us to laugh a little bit and remember the good things about the, the sailors and the crew that was on that ship. I did have an opportunity to meet the uh, cook that was on the Edmund Fitzgerald that had been on there for 10 years. We met in 2005 and you know sailors were sometimes little salty characters, their language and their actions. And <clears throat> Red Bergner's son gave me a, a chair off of the Edmund Fitzgerald and I said, where'd you get that? And he goes, oh my dad got three of them. Well, where did he get them from? Well, you know. I said, oh, sort of like my dad used to bring home porterhouse steaks in his, in his suitcase. <laughs> you know, it's just something that happens, I guess, and I'm telling on him. I hope he's enjoying this. Um, but I feel so honored and proud for all of you coming, but especially my family, so they can see what I've been doing since the year 2000. And it really means a lot. like to present this to the family and especially to you. It's a plaque. It says, no farewell words were spoken. No time to say goodbye. You were gone before we knew it and only God knows why. Yeah. Thank you for letting me share a few minutes about my father. 
Uh, nope, we're good. This is the Mighty Fitz going through the Sioux Locks, the big, uh, the big squeeze, if you will, loaded with 30,000 tons of iron ore, setting all kinds of cargo records. So um, right away, she started breaking records and then, quite frankly, breaking her own records as they loaded the ship bigger and bigger, and uh, that would hold for quite some time. She didn't stay as the longest ship for the longest time, but Carl Bradley actually had that record for many years. And then uh, the Paul Tregurtha, our thousand footer that's out there now, is now the queen of the lakes for the longest time. So Fitz had that title for a while and had some records for a while. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. <laughs> Did we have any other connections to the crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald here? Any other family members that were here? We're gonna talk to a crew member real quick. Uh, Captain, are you here? Captain Morgo, where are you at? Do you, do you have two seconds to chat with us, Skipper? One of the third mates, he was a relief skipper on board and uh, filled in for a crew member who was on vacation. And he actually got to take this same trip. And I'd like to introduce to you, he became a tub captain after he was third mate, Captain Dick Orgel. I was on a Fitzgerald <clears throat> very short time, but it was in uh, October, November, the uh, storm period. So uh, this led to me being uh, subpoenaed by the Coast Guard because they wanted to know more about how the ship reacted in the heavy weather. I was a third mate there. A uh, mate is a, uh, there's three mates on the ship. They're deck officers. It's just the captain, first, second, and third mate. I was only there on a relief basis, so I was third mate. And uh, we went through nothing bad, a couple of uh, gales. Nothing uh, out of the ordinary, and I I thought uh, uh, it was the greatest job to have. And I had my own room, and, uh, and most of my time was spent on tugboats, seagoing tugboats. So when you get on a ship like the Edmund Fitzgerald, that's like being uh, in a palace compared to a tugboat. The reason I went to tugboats was because. Uh, it's just a hard way to go, and for every day you work, you get a day off. So I got, was home half of the time with the family, whereas if, on ships you had to stay months at a time. Uh, I was there for, I did this for 48 years, uh, about 24 years on the salt water, and, and uh, another other 24 years on the Great Lakes, and the, and the connecting seaway. I had pilot's license for the for those waters, and uh, most of my time I was a captain, and uh, uh, a captain of a tugboat is familiar with uh, with uh, people getting in trouble, disasters, or anything. Mean, the first thing they do when they get ship gets in trouble is they want to call a tugboat. Uh, but the, the uh, crew on the Fitzgerald uh, was pretty consistent. Uh, I was on her, I think, two or three years before she sunk. And it was just about the same people on her. Uh, uh, I knew probably half of them. I was acquainted with uh, Captain McSorley. We were just acquaintances. Of and, uh, and then uh, the uh, chief engineer was uh, more than an acquaintance. He was a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, when I heard about this, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe a ship like that. Uh, that could happen to a ship like that. I was down in the lower St. Lawrence River down on Quebec when I got that message. Uh, I was on a seagoing tug. And it was just unbelievable that a ship like that could break up and sink like she did. Uh, I knew uh, Bob Rafferty. Him and I were shipmates uh, on a tanker years before the Fitz. And, uh, he, uh, I, uh, what I remember about him most was uh, uh, he was a baker and he used to put out a lot of little goodies for the night crew, you know. <laughs> but uh, he was from Toledo, out in Toledo, and I remember him very well. His daughter looks just like him. The first time I saw her, uh, four or five years ago, I think it was, maybe longer, was at that museum in Detroit where they, uh, I think Roscoe was there. He said, we're going to have some of the uh, survivors of their fits there. 
and uh, there was a group of ladies around the table. And the minute I saw her, I said to her, I know who you are. <laughs> she looked just like her father. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the whole thing was just a terrible, terrible. Uh, sailors shouldn't have to live like that, but that's the way it is. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, they had, there's a certain risk to go on to sea, but it shouldn't be excessive. I mean, when a, when a ship is not built well, uh, well built, you know, I mean, sailors shouldn't have to put up with that. And uh, so, uh, 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 well, uh, let me say, say that I wasn't didn't come here prepared to make a speech, but people always got questions about the Fitzgerald. If we got enough time, I could. If anybody got a question, I could maybe answer. If you want to. Just a little bit of time. We're trying to get to the 710. You know, with, with the countdown to 710, we've just maybe one quick question if somebody has one. Anybody got a question about it? Tell us about the springing. Yeah, why don't you tell us about the springing when you talked to Captain McSorley and in 10 foot seas you saw that ship? Oh. What was happening oh, when that uh, happened? I testified at the Board of Inquiry. Uh, we were just uh, coming out of Whitefish Point, going out into the lake. We were light going up to get a cargo. And it was, it was a, 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 it was a gale, and uh, out of the northwest. So he told me uh, he had been up in the river and taken her through the lock and everything, and he, and, uh, he wanted to go down below and go to bed. So we were coming to Whitefish Point, and he said to me, uh, we're going to take the scenic route. What he meant by that was we was going to go up on along the north shore of Lake Superior, get closer to the northern shore there for shelter. And that's what he called the scenic route. And uh, but when we were heading out into the lake, we're still in the bay. When that ship would plow into like a ten-foot sea, that isn't much, you know. Uh, and. Uh, and you could see the shock of the uh, of the impact of the wave on the bow. Just go right down the right down the deck. Now, of course, these ships bend. Uh, they have to do that. If they don't bend, they break. But I never saw anything quite like that. And I know, but when I was on her, I wasn't a greenhorn by any means. I had been uh, I'd been a, a mate and a captain on tugboats and everything. The reason I was on the Fitzer was a third mate was uh, between jobs. The company I was working for went belly up, and I, I took relief jobs on these ships. You know, and I was that's how I happened to be on the Fitz. And I remarked to the captain, who I knew before I went there, well, I just an acquaintance, so I said she seems to do a lot of bending for the amount of seaweed down here. And he said to me, "That's right." He said, "It scares me sometimes." Now this guy was an old-time captain. I mean, I don't want to see anything that scares him, you know. And, but he never elaborated. You know, I wanted to find out more about what this was about. But he would, then he went down below and and uh, told me if I, he told me about changing course or reducing speed or something to make the. Uh, you always want to uh, take as much stress and strain off the ship as you can, you know. And he said, I said, well, I'm not sure I would know when to do that. He said, well, I'm just going to lay down on top of my bed. He said, call me. So that's the great thing about being a third mate. You call a captain. You know, it's, it's when you're the captain, it's tough to know no one else to call. But, and then another time, uh, we were loaded, coming down, and it was big. And, uh, and, uh, and I said to him, uh, just trying to strike up a conversation, but he didn't converse much. He didn't, uh, he was just one-liners, but I said it must be nice to be on a ship like this after the Carrollton. The Carrollton was a little canaler. That was his first job as a captain. It's only 250 feet long, and uh, they're rough riding, tough little jobs. But that's his first job. He 